love working with Maple Run right in my backyard. So that is awesome. Welcome everybody. You can see, Alexis, can you give me a thumbs up? If you can see my screen, that's great. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so we're gonna talk about hope and resilience um, and think a little bit about how you're supporting your kids and also <clears throat> how you're supporting yourselves as we continue to um, navigate through this time. I just wanted to emphasize what Alexis said. I think one of the most helpful things about these kinds of conversations is when you can connect with each other in the chat, if that works for you and kind of see that you are not the only one who is feeling different ways or um, you know, kind of laugh together, whatever that might be. So feel free to have an active chat and Alexis is gonna keep an eye on that for me. So I wanted to kind of explain from my perspective um, what we expected um, from our students going into this school year and what we've learned. Um, I work in 13 school districts in um, northern and central Vermont, and um, so I have kind of a pretty big bird's eye view of what um, we have noticed. And so I'm talking now not just about Maple Run, but definitely um, your schools as well as the, the schools um, that surround you. So as we moved into this year, we were expecting that our students would need extra help with the transition in. We were expecting that they would need some time to adjust to like the noise and the crowds and um, the stamina that a busy full school day requires. Um, we were expecting them to maybe have some social awkwardness or blips, a little bit of immaturity. And we were expecting that their emotions might be um, heightened at times. And so we were ready for that. And we probably thought the same would be the case for the adults that work in the schools. So I was talking at August in August um, with different school groups as we were preparing about that kind of thing. So what's happened is that everything that we predicted has happened, but on a much bigger scale than what we expected. So um, the, the, the beginning of this school year has been really busy um, and the students have presented us with some pretty significant needs and adults are responding. So basically we're learning what it is that they need and adapting to that. Um, and I'm really impressed by what I'm seeing. Um, both I'm impressed by the level of need and I'm impressed by the response um, in a really good way. So I wanted to explain from my perspective um, why I think that is that this has been particularly tricky. And there's really, in my opinion, three main reasons that this school year has been so bumpy as we've gotten started. So the first one is something called stress-induced regression. What that means is that when you stress a person out, and this could be anybody, um, adult, kid, um, teenager, when you stress somebody out, sometimes they regress, which means they show you a less mature version of themselves. And part of that's because when you're stressed, you can lose access to some of your abilities, some of your coping skills, and some of your resources. And so that could look like maybe you're an adult and you're grocery shopping and you're really looking forward to cucumber salad and there's no cucumbers and you're like having some kind of version of a mild temper tantrum in the produce section because the cucumbers aren't there. Now, it's not really about cucumbers and you're usually better than that. <laughs> but you're having a big reaction to what you are know is a small problem. For kids that can look like they're playing a game and they lose, which is part of playing a game, and they're really upset about it, um, having a hard time recovering, having a hard time, um, you know, showing that kind of sportsmanship. It can look like crying over um, literally spilled milk or, um, you know, uh, not having what they want for lunch. Um, we're seeing it kind of all over the place. Basically, um, that kind of a regressed, less mature version of themselves. And it makes sense because um, even though we did heroic together with you, the people who work in your schools and you as families together did heroic efforts over the past year and a half to support our kids through this, putting them back in school this fall 
was what we would call positive stress. It was a really important thing to do. It was very good for them. And it is part of life going back to school. So when you're stressed by something that is an inherent part of daily life, we call it positive stress. And that's the context within which you grow new skills. It was extra stressful for them, still positive, but extra amounts of that this year because of all of the various factors of how they experienced school last year and opportunities and experiences that they didn't have. We thought they would developmentally be about six months immature. It's more like two full grade levels, to be honest with you. As a big whole group, I would say it's about two full grade levels. I was surprised by that. I'll be totally honest with you. I was predicting six months, it's two grade levels. So ninth graders are presenting with the needs of seventh graders at the beginning of the year, they were. Fifth graders are presenting as third graders, et cetera. So that was a surprise, which means we started the school year with expectations that they would be closer to what would be grade level um, typical with what they needed from us in terms of structure, supervision, and support. And the gap was much bigger than we anticipated. So we, of course, stress them out. When we expect them to do something that they're not quite yet able to do, that feels overwhelming. The good news about this part of the, of the equation is that this will be shorter lived and it's already starting to look better. So the part of this that has to do with stress-induced regression at the beginning of the year is improving. Um, and the teachers will tell you that um, there are days that seem much better, even stretches of days that seem much better. And that's how things work. It's not like all of a sudden one day, everything's all better. It's a very gradual regulation of a group of people that are dysregulated. So it's starting to look like longer and longer stretches of time. And the days that are bumpy are a little bit less bumpy. Um, and, you know, the reality is if, if somebody is stressed, regressing because of stress, if you pulled them out of the situation that's stressing them, they would calm down and they would regulate and have their skills again, but you would not have promoted their resilience. So the best thing for us to have done for them at the time was to keep them in school and keep them on their route teen and teach them the skills and offer them the support and, and help them um, regulate in that setting. So it was bumpy for sure. And it was also the best and right thing to do for them to have restarted school the way we did and keep them in that situation with support. So I said, there's three big reasons. The second um, reason is something that psychologists call biological relativity. So basically what that means is that when a child or a teenager has a stressful experience or has some kind of adversity, if it's big enough and if it goes on for long enough, it can interrupt their ability to make a developmental gain. So I'll explain what that means. I'll give you an example. Um, how our development works as children and teenagers is that we are supposed to develop things in a specific order. We develop skills and then um, we move on to other skills and they build up. That's how we grow our brain and our kind of whole developmental system. So because of that, our brain is designed in this incredibly fascinating way where when we're about to have a growth spurt, our brain opens up, like if you think of it as a window, the window opens really wide and the brain is totally ready for experiences that are gonna help them learn a new skill or make a have a developmental leap. So a very classic example is six month old babies are babbling and then their brain window for verbal language opens way up and it waits. And if people talk to the baby, play with the baby, interact with the baby, and have all kinds of face-to-face -face experiences, mostly play-based and, and kind of um, nurturing and interacting, then the baby has an incredible growth spurt in talking, and they go from babbling to full-on um, you know, paragraphs and conversations by age three. That happens so fast and so remarkable, in part because the window was wide open, and in part because of the experiences. And then that window closes, but it doesn't shut. It just closes. So you can learn new things at any point, but it's not quite as open, quite as smooth when you're in a, in a later developmental phase. 
So that window closes and then another one opens for kind of like the next thing and it hopes for the enrichment and the experiences that are gonna come. So basically what biological relativity means is that if while the window's open, whatever the stress or adverse event is prevents kids from having the experiences that they need at that really critical time, it can look like they're really immature. It can look like they have gaps in their skill development. So for example, a elementary school student would have been um, work like window wide open for emotional regulation. And a kid that's in later elementary, early middle school years would have had their window wide open for learning a lot of social skills. And um, teenagers would have had their window wide open to learn executive functioning, which is like planning, organization, time management, impulse control, those kinds of things. So the way in which this impacted our kids was determined by um, the experiences that they did or didn't have and whether they were so stressed that they might've been distracted and just kind of focused on surviving. We did all kinds of things to keep each other safe that were critically important to have done at the time and still now we're doing things that are um, incredibly important to pe keep people safe. And everything that we did in terms of keeping school open was incredibly important. If we hadn't done that, we would be in much bigger trouble right now. So everything that we did mattered and the impact was bigger than we expected because in, in hindsight, what I can see is that even though they were in school, they were not having the healthy activities in groups to the same amount. There was a lot less play dates, um, extracurricular activities, um, working in groups in school, playing at recess with very different groups of kids, um, chit-chatting at lunch, all of those different things that transitions, like moving from one place to another, basically there was a lot less of those kinds of experiences for a really long time, a year and a half. And so now we're seeing what looks like immaturity and it is just that. So the other thing I wanna really reassure you about is they are not damaged. This is not permanent. They do not have disorders. They're just immature. And now that we have them back with us and we're seeing what it is that they need, we're shifting and adapting and adjusting what we're prioritizing. So for example, a fourth grade teacher might be able to assume that the majority of his or her students can line up and go to unified arts like music or PE without a lot of pre-teaching. They kind of have learned by fourth grade how that works. Um, what we're seeing now is that they are acting like second graders when it comes to something like line up, move through the hall and enter a new experience. So we're just slowing that down in the months of September and October, um, practicing it, going back and redoing it, talking about the expectations and rewarding and reinforcing and encouraging them when they're being um, respectful, safe and responsible community members as they're moving through the building. And then that settles in and they have that skill and now we move on. It just takes longer because some of the things that we usually would have had mastered by that point, we're having to go back and teach. It's not a problem unless we start stressing ourselves out about having to catch them up. So the thing we're resisting is saying that we're going to get the kids caught up to some perceived point by some perceived time. That's not good for child development. What We don't rush child development. We meet the kids developmentally where they're at and we move them as far forward academically, socially, and emotionally this year as we can. And that's what your schools are doing. And it's going well. And, and I feel really hopeful about how far we're going to get this school year. So at home, I'm sure what that looks like is probably for many of you somewhat similar. People are um, resisting the routines of going to bed. People are cranky and grumpy. Um, when you try to play and have fun, it can sometimes turn into bickering, um, meltdowns over small problems, all the same kinds of things that we're seeing at school. I'm guessing you might be seeing at home. And it's the same thing. There's stress. So there's some regression that's going to going to improve over time. 
and they have gaps in skills. So we need to go back as their um, as their adults at home, their parents and caregivers, and support them in ways that we might not have had to um, or thought we would have had to. Um, and that's how we kind of move forward. The third big reason that I think things have been so hard is that families and people who work in schools together were in a little bit of a collective denial about what this school year would look like. We were all sort of sick of the pandemic and well, not sort of very sick of the pandemic and the um, things felt good and safe in terms of risk around that this summer. And so we sort of started the school year really together as a group of people expecting it to feel quite different and quite normal and much better. And then we started the school year and the Delta variant was among us and um, we uh, or were masking again and we were um, having to navigate um, people being out on quarantine and it actually didn't feel a lot different. And so that was super disappointing when you're expecting something to be much better and different and it actually feels just as complicated or more, um, that can feel like a punch in the gut. So what that does is it moves a group of people in September and October um, into something, oops, I thought I had a slide there that I don't no worries, um, into something that I would um, think of as like a grief response. So when you have a group of people, I'm just gonna check, I think I might have this at the bottom. Nope, it's just not even there, no worries. Um, when you have a group of people who are grieving, um, that can get tricky because when groups of people are grieving, um, grief is like something that we move through in phases and different people are in different phases of grief at different times. So um, there's usually some kind of denial. Then there's bargaining, which means you're trying to find ways to control things you can't control. Um, and you're um, you know, trying to see if you can like work your way out of this being your reality. And then you could move into anger where you're angry. And sometimes you find like, we're not very good at, as human beings at being angry at a situation. So we might try to find a person to blame and direct our anger at that person. Um, and then we could get sad or depressed. Then you move into acceptance, which is the last phase of grief. And that's a peaceful phase where you've moved through those emotions and those different stances. And you kind of feel like, I get it now. This is part of my life, part of my narrative, part of who I am. And you adapt and you cope better. And then you move forward with that experience and the wisdom you've gained from it. The problem is when you have a group of people who are grieving, like if, if Barb was angry and I was in denial and I run into her in the grocery store and I'm pretending this isn't happening and she's venting to me, she just needs to be angry right now. And I just need to be in denial right now. But what we need is bumping up against each other. So that could end up looking like we're bickering with each other, but there's actually no problem between her and I, we're just in different grief phases. So I've seen this a lot in the different communities that I've connected with, and it does make my heart really sad, which is to see parents and teachers and people who work together and live together in communities and, and coexist um, kind of tense with each other and I can see that it's not about them or their relationship. It's about the situation that we're all in. And I worry because I worry that people will personalize it. So it's tricky for us right now because we're all sensitive and we're all a bit on edge um, and we're trying to get to that place of acceptance together. So stress-induced regression, skill gaps, and collective grief. Those are the three reasons that in, in large part, I think explains why this school year has been so bumpy so far. And we are adapting to that and, and we're kind of moving forward. So let me, there are some notes here and I'll, I'll share this with Alexis so she can share these slides out with you. These are basically just notes of the points that I made. So let me pause and um, give you a chance to write, if you haven't already, a question in the chat. Um, and I know you're probably still just thinking about what I've been saying. So I'll give you a minute to think and ask a question if you have one.
Has anybody had a temper tantrum over cucumbers or some similar moment like that where you've showed stress induced regression? You can give me a little thumbs up on your screen. <laughs> I made up the cucumber story, but I could totally see myself doing that. All right, I don't see any questions, so I'm gonna move forward. Oop. <laughs> Every day, nice. All right, if you have, if you think of a question or a comment, feel free to write that in and um, Alexis will let me know. Okay, so there are a couple articles in here that make some really important and timely points. So if one of the things that you find reassuring is to read about what's going on in other parts of the country or for other folks, these articles are helpful. The first one is one where they interviewed people that work in schools all over the country. Um, and they kind of basically said what I just said. Um, and the message is, is also, it's validating, but it's also hopeful. So I found that article helpful. The second article talks about um, play with kids right now of all ages, elementary, middle, and high school. And it talks about how there's a difference between unstructured play, structured play, and organized play. And it's a really short but interesting article about how right now kids need organized play. We are finding, and you might be finding this at home too, when you have just downtime, um, kids are really struggling to figure out how to um, get that, have that go well um, and, and have that be productive. And so we are noticing things like at recess, if you have stations where adults are positioned strategically to be involved in what's going on and there's an activity at each station, it goes a thousand times better um, and, and there, I think when you're doing that, kids are building those skills. So I would think about that at home too, in terms of like, if you're noticing that the struggles that you're having with kids are during unstructured time, you might try to think about how to have an activity or something that organizes it a little bit more, like a craft project, a board game, taking a walk, doing something like that. Um, you don't wanna be rigid about it. Um, but, but I think that's likely to be helpful for kids. Alexis, are there questions or are people just chatting? There was just a question about if the links could be put in the chat and I just reiterated that the slides would be shared and okay. they could access the links on the slides. Awesome. Okay, so when I think about this from a family and a parent perspective, and I think about what are the ways that we can help, the, if, if a big part of this is because they're stressed, basically we wanna lower their stress level and then they will show us the best versions of themselves and they will be most available for the skill development and learning that we want them to have to kind of get back on track with their development. So one of the ways that we lower the stress level of um, families is that we um, we do more organized structured play, as I just said, and then we actually think about what would we do for a child that has something like an anxiety disorder or a child who's depressed or a child who has attention deficit. That doesn't mean that your kids have all those disorders all of a sudden, but the strategies that we use for those kids are going to work for any person who's stressed. So it's, if you were gonna put effort into something, and I know we're all sorta of at our max, but if you were gonna put effort into something, I would say really prioritize a predictable visual schedule for the day and the week, um, a calendar, have a weekly family meeting where you kind of talk through this week. What are the different things that are going on? Can we um, predict any problems or things that we need to organize ahead? Um, does somebody need a specific pair of jeans clean for a certain day? You know, you're planning that ahead and you're solving ahead of time little problems that might come up. In a regular time, you might be able to get away with kind of flying by the seat of your pants. That is a more stressful way to move through a week. And if our stress is already up here, that's gonna create that overflow that's gonna be problematic. 
So we lower the stress level by having a visual schedule. When you make it visual, it, it, the brain doesn't have to work as hard to figure out what, the, what they're supposed to be doing, get things done and stay on track. So it has nothing to do with how intelligent or capable you are in a, in a typical time. It has to do with how stressed you are and visuals help. The other thing is um, anticipating transition. So for example, if you're driving home from spending the day Saturday out, you know, doing errands or whatever, and when you get home, if you're driving home with your kids, in your mind, when we get home, it seems obvious to you, we're going to unload the car, we're going to put the groceries away, maybe somebody's going to help me take the dog out, we're going to get a couple other things done, then we can sit down and relax as a family, watch some TV, do whatever. Your kids have a very different idea of what's going to happen when you get out of the car. They might be waiting to go inside, plop down, relax, turn the TV on. So the problem when everyone walks in is not necessarily that people are being naughty or lazy or defiant or unhelpful. You just have a misset of expectations. And that's a moment where when, when tensions are already or stress is already high, again, we can have an overflow moment. So basically, as you're driving home, just say, hey, let's just talk about when we get home exactly what's going to happen. I need your help for 15 minutes. And he, I'm going to give each of you three things to do. And if you, once you've done those three things, which should take you no more than 15 minutes, you can go and relax and do whatever you want to do. And then when everyone walks in the door, the expectations are clear. Um, the idea here is that we're slowing down and we're taking more time to make things more predictable um, and talk things through ahead of time, which will lower stress and lower problems. When I make suggestions like that to parents and teachers who are tired and overwhelmed, it can feel like, I'm not sure I can do more. I feel like you're asking me to do more. And I totally get that. But if you put effort into that, you won't have to put energy and effort into solving problems um, and trying to redirect people. So I'm basically asking you to take energy that you would put in one place and move it into another, and it's going to feel more productive. The other thing I'm hearing from parents a lot right now is that kids are being really self-critical, especially when they get home. They're um, talking about themselves in a negative way. I'm stupid. Nobody likes me. I can't do this anymore, which is really just kind of that um, feeling discouraged, frustrated, or stressed kind of leaking out in that way. Um, when that happens, a mistake that parents make is try to sit down and have an hour and a half conversation about how amazing their kid is and convince them out of that way of thinking. That's not actually the most helpful thing to do. Even though you probably have an hour and a half of information about how great your kid is, all you want to do is basically say, hey, I would not let someone else talk to you like that. I am definitely not going to let you talk to you like that. So please say that again in a way that's kinder to yourself. And if you get no response, say, okay, I'll do it for you. You're really smart. I made your brain and it's awesome. And then you walk away, right? So basically you just want them to re-say it in a more positive self-kind way. If they can't, they can phone a friend and you can do it for them. And then you move on. So basically in these little tiny doses, you're shifting their internal script. They're giving you a little window into their internal script, which is pretty negative and that's worrisome, but we're trying to change the script in many, many, many small doses. And I can guarantee you that adults at school are doing the same thing for them if they hear them say that kind of thing. That's what will shift it, not the long in-depth conversations where they're convincing you that they're not okay and you're convincing them that they are. So when I say organized structured play with adult involvement, here's what I have in mind. Basically the lagging skills, when I showed that biological relativity thing and, and I said that they have lagging or, or skill gaps, the best way to learn those skills is through play. No matter how old you are, even if you were an adult, the best way to learn those skills is through play. So if you could think about my kid's driving me crazy, or I'm really worried about my kid. 
because they're doing what? They're arguing with me, they're interrupting me, they're bickering with their friends, they're doing impulsive things. Um, and, and then you want to say, what is the, what is the skill that they are lacking that's showing me this behavior? What we don't want to do is start describing our kids as disrespectful, disruptive, um, lazy, anxious, and so on. Because if they hear their adults talking about them in that way, and interestingly, um, there is some research that would suggest even if we don't say it to them, but we think it about them or talk about them in that way outside of their view, they somehow by os osmosis kind of figure out that that's what we think and, and it infiltrates their self view. So instead you wanna say, not my kid is naughty or disruptive or defiant, my kid is impulsive. Okay, great. That is a skill that they're not good at yet. So um, they, are, they seem really unkind. They're kind of mean to their brothers and sisters. And um, what is the skill that's lacking? perspective taking or compassion or empathy. So perspective taking is something they're not good at yet. Now we're moving from kind of being um, upset, worried, frozen to action and growth mindset where we're thinking about <coughs> what is the skill that's lacking? What are the experiences that I can provide my child and that the school can provide my child to build those skills? So then you Google Impulsive game, games that, that help impulsivity, um, games that build perspective taking skills. So you'll get ideas and suggestions, and then you basically play with them within the way that they need to um, practice that skill to win the game or do well in the game. And all of a sudden they're better. So examples, perspective taking is putting yourself in someone else's shoes, looking at things from another person's point of view. Apples to apples is a game where you can't get a point unless you think like the other person. Charades, learning, getting, get a deck of cards, watch a YouTube video on how to do a magic trick, um, practice it, and then see if you can trick a relative at Thanksgiving or something like that, where, um, per, you know, you, you're basically playing together in this way where you're thinking from the other person's perspective, are they going to see what I'm doing with the cards? Impulse control, red light, green light, Simon says, freeze dance, you play music and you periodically stop the music and people have to freeze and the last person to move is out. And then you keep going until everyone's out and you reset. Any game of chance helps with the idea of winning and losing with grace. I am hearing from lots of folks who work in schools, especially middle schools, that for some reason, kids are really getting quite emotional when they lose. And so um, we're doing a lot of games with chance. Basically, a game with chance means that you mostly win or lose because of luck, not necessarily skill, like rock, paper, scissors, um, sorry, uno, that kind of thing. Planning and problem solving, Jenga, marble runs, dominoes, scavenger hunts. Um, and then any kind of focus or attention worry would be hula hooping, juggling, memory games, things like that. So you can brainstorm together and think about um, different things that you can do. Any research that you read would tell you that the best way to learn those skills is through play and activities that are fun and experiences. We do have SEL curriculum and it's great, but it only works if it's paired with play and, and activities that are interactive amongst groups of people. Okay. Alexis, anything in the chat that I should answer or should I just keep going? Just agreement with what you're saying. So nice job. Awesome. Do not hesitate to put questions if you have them in the chat. I wanna make sure I tend to those. Okay, here's another thing that's really hard and really, really important that parents can do to support kids if school feels hard. So. I did get a lot of amazing questions in the Google Doc ahead of time when people signed up for this conversation. And um, one of the, the questions that came up a few times was, was about kids maybe feeling like at school things were rocky and um, how to help them understand um, the things that they're experiencing at school. 
Maybe they're having substitute teachers more often than normal. Maybe they're having trouble, um, you know, finding friendship groups to connect with. Maybe they are just finding that the environment at school is more stressful than normal. So when your kid comes home and starts telling you about their day or showing you about their day with their grumpy mood or behavior, um, you want to resist the temptation to start giving them suggestions for how to solve the problem. You can certainly do that, not while they're feeling their big emotions about the situation. So they come through the door. How is your day? Horrible. Why? And they tell you 14 reasons why. And you want to say, thanks for letting me know. I'm really glad you told me. It sounds like it was very hard. You're home now. Let's take a walk, make dinner together, play a game, maybe watch a show together for a little bit. Kind of let's get your mind off it. We'll check in about it again later and see if you want to talk about it or not. So the routine of home and distraction is going to be plus validation. Yes, that sounds hard. Now you're home, let's have a rhythm and a routine to home that's not overly rigid, but predictable. Get in that routine. Later in the, in the evening, you can say, hey, do you wanna talk about your day? Cause you listed a bunch of things that were hard. At that point, they'll either say no. And then you're like, okay, great. I'm glad you let me know. Or they might say yes. And then you can sit down and talk about it and you can ask them, do you want a suggestion? for me. I have ideas of how you could cope with that. Do you want them or not? When parents are worried about their kids and they're worried about what's going on in part of their kids' lives that they're not present for, like school, it is really hard to not talk about it a lot with other adults. It is really hard to not try to mine your kid for information to see what's really going on. Both those things increases the stress level of the child significantly. So we want to resist that temptation. If you need information about what's going on at school, absolutely reach out to school. They want to hear from you. You, you could let them know this doesn't seem, sound quite right. Could you help me understand what's going on? It's just not in front of the kid or getting that information from them. The, the thing they need from you is validation routine and distraction, and then check back in later. I can tell you as a parent, I have not always followed this rule. <laughs> it is really hard to do, but it is really important. Okay, um, just checking the time here. All right, this is a, a 90 second video that has a metaphor. So we're gonna listen to this. And um, one thing I wanna mention as you hear this is that He's specifically going to talk about teenagers, but I believe that what he's saying is relevant to kids of all ages, especially right now. Imagine you're on a roller coaster. You know, you sit down in the seat, first thing that happens, there's some guy that walks around and sort of pushes down that lap safety bar, secures the lap safety bar. Now, if you're like me, what's the very first thing you do? You grab that bar, you push it, you prod it, you wiggle it, you test it. Now, think about it. I mean, do you push and prod and test and wiggle that bar hoping that it will give, hoping that it will fail, leading to your inevitable death as you splat on the pavement? Of course not. You push it and you prod it and you test it, hoping, confirming it will hold. Listen to me. That teen in your life is doing the exact same thing. They are pushing you and prodding you and testing you, hoping, confirming you will hold. I mean, at a time in their life when so many things are uncertain, they need to know that you are certain. At a time in their life when so many things are unstable, they need to know that you are stable. And at a time in their life when so many things are erratic, they need to know that you are consistent. So good news. If the teen in your life pushes you, it doesn't mean you're a bad person or an imbecile or doing it all wrong or messing things up or saying the wrong things. It simply means you're dealing with a teenager. So 
what can feel really hard when, when families are tired, when families are frustrated, when families are stressed, it can feel like one of the ways that we try to take care of ourselves or respond is we kind of let go of some structure. We let go of some rules and we try to go easy on people by easing up on expectations and rules. It's actually the worst thing we could do. Sticking with expectations, sticking with routine and sticking with rules, but not rigidly is actually the way to keep things manageable, keep things predictable and help you get through that time. So in this Ferris wheel metaphor, if you're on the Ferris wheel and you test it to make sure it holds, you don't want it to get restrictive. That doesn't feel good. So we don't want to be like punishment oriented or rigid with rules. We also don't want to be floppy. You don't want that bar to be floppy. That's going to feel really scary. So if kids are pushing to say, are you still going to make me go to bed at bedtime? Are you still going to tell me I have to get off the video game? And you're like, yeah, whatever. Um, that feels floppy and they actually feel more stressed and more um, anxious and more startled. So it, it seems like they're trying to seek control, but if they actually get control, they feel more scared rather than less. So right now is a really good time to think about um, a reset. If you feel like your family needs one, you might already be on this if so great, but if you need a reset around things like sleep, is the most important factor in mental health for kids. I always, as a psychologist working with kids and teenagers, treat sleep first. So a consistent bedtime and a good night's sleep is the big, biggest gift you can give yourself and them. That often goes along with um, uh, limits around technology and, and video gaming and things like that. So those two go hand in hand. And then the third thing is nutrition. So, um, and, and then the fourth is exercise. So you're going to significantly lower your kid's stress. If they have a regular sleep cycle, they have time for technology, but it is a specific time that's limited. And, and then they have, um, good nutrition that's on a regular pattern and, and movement and exercise. So when our kids are testing us and they're rattling that bar, you want to move, pull them closer and have them help you with whatever it is that you're doing. Come with me. Seems like you're having a hard time making good choices. Come closer. We'll do some stuff together. Um, you could schedule if you feel like technology, personal devices, phones, social media, video gaming, you feel like, whoa, it's way out of whack with what I would want it to be. The best way to change that is to set a date that's somewhat in the near future for when the reset is going to start um, and include kids in the decision making around, do you want this to be like Friday or Monday or, you know, November, you know, 20th or 23rd. So you give them some choice and then you include them in the decisions around how that's going to go. And you include yourself in the reset. So when you decide as a family, for example, phones are all gonna be in the phone chargers. Um, and then, you know, when, when we're hanging out as a family or during dinner, or when we all go to bed, you wanna follow those same habits. So if you're with your kids against the problem, it tends to go much better. Um, kids of all ages right now, being as stressed as they are, should have no matter what's and privileges, and you can even post them visually. The no matter what's are no matter what, even on our worst day, we're gonna have outside play, we're gonna have um, you know, family time, things like that, arts and crafts, music, whatever that might be. Um, but, and the privileges are technology usually, um, you know, play dates, things like that. And um, basically every day is a fresh start and the privileges are on hold until you've kind of done what you need to do, and then you can access them. If you haven't done what you need to do, then the privileges are simply paused until your child gets back on track, and then they're unpaused. They kind of need immediate reward for effort toward following expectations right now um, in order to kind of get their motivation back on track. Um, so if you feel like it doesn't matter, I can punish them, I can reward them, they don't care, they're not motivated, 
the no matter what's privileges, pause the privileges till they're on track and immediately unpause them. That tends to work if you're in that kind of situation. So when you're talking to kids and they're doing something that you um, wish they would do differently or um, they're doing some kind of disruptive behavior, your approach should really focus on what you want them to do instead, not what they're doing and the negative outcome of what they're doing. So if Stacy were swearing at me right now, I would not want to say, Stacy, I don't like it when you swear. It hurts my feelings, blah, blah, blah. I would just say, Stacy, can you try that again with kinder, more respectful words, such as, you know, why don't you walk out of the room, come back in, try that again um, in, you know, like a kinder tone. Clear your throat. You got some rude stuck in it. Let me know when you're ready and start over. The do-overs, the replacement, invite them to that, and then you move on with life. That's a lot more effective than long, drawn-out conversations about the negative thing they're doing. Let me just pause and see if there are questions before I make the last couple points. We do have one question. So uh, the question is, you said that kids are presenting two grades lower. Are you seeing that in the preschool level as well? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, you know, definitely different group of groups of kids are impacted differently. And I would say that um, the most significant impact is kindergarten and ninth grade. The least significant impact is 11th and 12th graders and preschoolers. That makes sense to me when I think about child development. I'm not saying preschool is going remarkably smoothly. I think that um, many kids that are three and four years old, many of them did not have um, childcare, um, you know, with groups of kids um, as much as they would have otherwise. And so they might be showing us um, just a, a need to kind of get used to that environment and the routines. It's also improving rapidly um, and they're learning kind of how to do the morning meetings and the um, uh, station work and, and all those kinds of things. So, um, so the answer is no, definitely not two years of social emotional delay in preschool. There is um, need for adjustment for sure. And the 11th and 12th graders seem to have fared better probably because they got through um, uh, two thirds of their 10th grade year before this happened and had a lot of growth on a typical trajectory prior to the disruption for 12th graders in particular. Good question. All right, keep coming with the questions if you have them. So in the last few minutes that I had, I wanted to leave you with a few thoughts about um, you taking care of yourself and some of the things that, um, you know, that will be helpful to you. So we're trying to create a family culture and at school, we're trying to create a school culture where there's a balance between the ability to say, this is hard and in what ways and have people just validate that without needing to fix it and appreciation for what's good and looking forward to future things in the future, that hope, future hope and orientation and balancing both out. If we go too far in the direction of um, wallowing in what's not going well, that can create this kind of negative swirl so if we're gonna vent, we wanna make sure that we're venting in a productive way. A productive vent means if I, somebody asks me in the grocery store, how's your day? I wanna pause and ask myself, if my day were a newspaper article, what would the title be? I don't wanna start reading the whole article to them. I, we don't have time for that. That's gonna overwhelm them. And we're gonna both leave feeling worse. If I just say the title, we can connect on the themes. I can get their title and our interaction is gonna feel 
more productive and, and connected. So we're trying to stay with themes and not get bogged down in the details um, when we're connecting with each other. So in terms of this idea then of balancing that out, um, there's a book that I'm listening to right now. Um, and if you are a reader or you like audiobooks, I'm actually doing the audiobook. And it's called The Book of Hope by Jane Goodall. And I just included it here because it's been remarkably helpful to me. So I thought I would share it out with you. Um, Jane Goodall is the um, scientist who wor has worked with chimpanzees and um, you know, thinking about uh, the earth and animals and different things like that. And she's quite a remarkable person and has witnessed a lot of hard things in her life. And in this book, um, she talks about hope being an action. So optimism and pessimism are dispositions, like kind of ways of being in general. But hope, she says, is something that's very active. So if you're feeling hopeless, helpless, discouraged, disheartened, she would tell you to not think big picture. That's actually going to make you feel worse. She would tell you to think about today, right now, what is one thing that you're appreciative of and what is one thing that you can do to make things better, even if it's very small. And when you're doing that one thing to make things better, remember that there are other people in your family, other people in your community, other people in your world who are also doing things to make things better. And it's the accumulation of all those small actions that actually will improve our general circumstance. So when I heard Jane explain that, I realized that um, I was actually going through the week, kind of getting more and more discouraged by Friday, spending the week getting my hope back up only to kind of go through the week and do the same thing. So this idea of each morning, just thinking about what's today, I'm just going to focus on today and what's the, what are the things I'm doing to make things better? I have actually felt a lot more hopeful. So I thought I would share that with you. There's another really important thing. Um, I don't know if I have time to show this video, um, but it's linked in here if you want to watch it. It's really funny. Alexis and I were both saying it's one of our favorites. Um, this is Brene Brown, and it's a very funny short video where she tells a story about how when people are stressed, they can go on fault-finding missions. When you feel like you can't control the thing that's really um, hurtful to you or your family, you can kind of look for who can I blame for this. We are not good at being mad at situations, which I said before. So when the situation, which is COVID, is the thing that's disrupting our lives, we try to find a place that we can direct um, that blame to. And that can end up being pretty unproductive because we can end up, um, you know, uh, you know, blaming our neighbor, blaming somebody at school, blaming somebody in our family when really it's the situation and it creates tension between us. So it's a very funny video that humanizes this thing that we do. And it can remind you if someone's coming at you with blame, you want to step to the side and let it go by and then come back and say, I'm sorry that you're having such a hard time. If you're the one who has discharged the blame, you want to try to own that and circle back when you can. And if your kid's blaming you, same thing, step to the side, <laughs> let them know. All right. So let me come back to the big group. That, those were my thoughts. Pause for a minute here to see if there are any additional questions. All right, Alexis, I think we did it. Thanks everybody for jumping in and joining us and for how hard you're no doubt working to take care of your kids and families. Yes, thank you all for joining us this evening and a big thank you to Joelle for taking the time to meet with us this evening as well. So thanks so much. Take care everybody.